Welcome to CSIS Online. The way we bring you events is changing, but we'll still present live analysis and award-winning digital media from our Dracopolis Ideas Lab. All on your time, live or on demand. This is CSIS Online. Hello, I'm Caitlin Welsh, Director of the Global Food Security Program at the Center for Strategic and International Studies. In partnership with the UN Food and Agriculture Organization's Liaison Office in Washington, CSIS welcomes you to our online event, Global Food Supply Chains, an Early Assessment of COVID-19 Impacts. I'm particularly excited about today's conversation. COVID-19 has certainly affected food security at home and around the world. But across the media and in the public, I'm sensing a misunderstanding of the causes of rising food insecurity. I sense a misplaced blame on global food supply chain disruptions and a misunderstanding of the nature of these disruptions in the first place. Today's experts will present an early analysis of the impacts of COVID-19 on global food supply chains, showing an overall positive picture, one you don't often hear in the media. Today's experts will assess the impacts of supply chain disruptions where they did happen on food security. And finally, they'll speak about what we can expect from global food supply chains for the, for the duration of the pandemic. We will draw on findings of the 2020 State of Agricultural Commodities Markets, the SOCO report, released just last week by the UN Food and Agriculture Organization. There are none more qualified to explain these things than the guests joining us today. Maximo Torero, the Chief Economist at the Food and Agriculture Organization of the UN. Rob Voss, Director of the Markets, Trade and Institutions Division at IFPRI, the International Food Policy Research Institute. And Rose Souza Richards, Seed Health Manager at the International Seed Federation. Soon, Maximo will deliver a short keynote on the impacts of COVID-19 on global food supply chains. Uh, I'll then turn to our panelists, Rob and Rose, who will answer a few questions from me and then from you, our audience. And if you'd like to submit questions for our audience, um, please, do, please use the Q&A button on, uh, at, uh, at the bottom of the, the Zoom screen. We will wrap up at 10.15. And with this, I'm happy to turn to our event's co-host, Vim Lendra Sharan, to give introductory remarks and to introduce our first speaker. Over to you, Vim Lendra. Thank you, Caitlin, uh, and I warm welcome to all our speakers and participants joining in from uh, various corners of the globe. Uh, would be morning, afternoon, evening across the globe. So good morning, good afternoon, good evening to all of you. Uh, and a special thank you to CSIS with whom we have had a letter of understanding under which we try and arrange meaningful dialogues on topical issues in a way apolitical in a very open and a very informative format and i'm sure today's discussion will be following the same apolitical open transparent uh, informative format and you will hear from our uh, panelists uh, great insights into the pandemic and its impact covid 19 pandemic is still raging and uh, we are not yet out of it but enough time has gone by for a initial impact assessment to be done on what it has done to the global food supply. Uh, needless to say, the pandemic introduced unexpected uh, stresses on the food system, creating many challenges. Yet what is really remarkable is the speed with which the uh, supply chain actors have regrouped themselves and reorganized themselves to ensure continued availability of food across the globe. Uh, it has imposed shocks on all segments of the food supply chain, whether it be production, food processing, transport, logistics, and also on demand. Uh, farm production has faced bottlenecks for some inputs. To start with, we had labor shortages, especially impacting high value commodities like fruits, vegetables, etc. Seed is a highly globalized sector, but yet you will hear with multiplication, production, processing happening in various parts of the world, packaging happening elsewhere. It's a, a highly globalized industry and has, therefore, is also susceptible to any disruptions. Processing got disrupted. We all know about meat plants and how they had to close down because of labor shortages and shutdowns. Transportation disruptions happened, but uh, again, 
uh, tended to regroup and reorganize themselves very fast. Various modes have seen various impacts. Uh, air transport has seen a much uh, larger impact and still is seeing a much larger impact than other modes of transport. Consumer demand shifted. So non-home food, which accounted for 30 to 35 percent, uh, suddenly found no market and it was not possible to immediately ramp up retail to take care of the uh, fall there. So multiple things have happened and multiple ways in which food systems got impacted. I think various policy lessons also came out. It, it became very clear that open and predictable markets have been a key and have been critical in ensuring food supply. Uh, it's also quite clear that diverse supply sources are, are important and relying on one supply source can cause a problem, especially with the globalized, uh, complicated uh, food uh, supply chain, which is there. But what is also extremely clear is that despite all this, there are vulnerable sections which are suffering from food scarcity. And for them, the issue is of access. The economic recession, the loss of jobs, the loss of income has meant that many more people have gone into poverty. And for them, it has become more an issue of access to food rather than availability in terms of global supply. To speak to these issues, we have a fantastic uh, panel and uh, leading the flock is Maximo Torero, uh, who I have the proud pleasure of introducing now. Uh, Maximo is the chief economist of Food and Agriculture Organization. He joined the organization in 2019 and ha has had a illustrious career before uh, coming and joining us in 2019. He's a national of Peru and holds a PhD and master's degree in economics from University of California, Los Angeles, and a bachelor's degree in economics from University of Pacific Lima, Peru. Uh, prior to joining FAO, uh, Maximo was at the World Bank. He worked as the group executive director for Argentina, Bolivia, Chile, Paraguay, Peru and Uruguay. And prior to that, uh, he led the Division of Markets, Trade and Institutions at IFPRI. Uh, his major research work is extremely interesting as in um, he is an expert at analyzing poverty and inequality, uh, things which are really topical today uh, in light of the pandemic. And uh, as a uh, vast experience in, in Latin America, Sub-Saharan, uh, Africa, and Asia. So I think we wouldn't have had a better speaker than Maximo to really uh, address the issue of global food supply chains and, uh, uh, and analyze the initial impact that uh, uh, COVID-19 has had on the supply chain, as also what he thinks is uh, going to unfold as the second wave seems to be picking up and one doesn't know where the pandemic is going from here. So. Proud pleasure to introduce Maximo Torreira to all of you. Maximo, the floor is yours. Thank you very much, Melendra. Let me share my, my PowerPoint. I hope you can see it. So thank you very much for the invitation. It's a pleasure uh, to be here. What I will do is a, 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 a review of what are the major developments that we have been seeing in the global food market. A major focus on the staples, but also talking about a high value commodities, which are fruits, vegetables, meat, uh, and fish. So the presentation is divided in five sections, uh, developing global food markets, supply chain disruptions, policy responses, risk and uncertainties, and lessons learned and conclusions. So the first thing to understand is uh, that we are at 96 points in August uh, of the uh, food price index of FAO, which is still down 30% from its February 2011 peak. So it's important to understand this because if we compare for each of the commodities and for the aggregate index relative to the peak, like the global food price index of FAO is minus 30% with respect to the peak, which was in February 2011. In cereals, which the peak was in June 2008, we are still 38% under it. In oils, which was in February 2011, the peak, we are minus 44%. In sugar, minus 56%. In meat, minus 22%. And in dairy, which the peak was in February 2014, we are in minus 35%. So prices are not at the highest level. Uh, they have been evolving and increasing for certain reasons that we'll explain, but they are basically stable. And we expect that in the future prices should be settled down uh, because of the recession that we are going to, to be entering. So food prices measured by the FAO price index uh, fell during the first five months of the year. And by May 2020, uh, it registered a 17 month low, but food prices started to rise since June. And this is because of some of the pressures of some of the restocking and, and some of the pressures on, on feedstock that are happening today. 
but also rising prices were supported by this light in the US uh, exchange and some rebound in demand. So the exchange rate is playing a crucial role. In the first month, we saw a, a dollar which was uh, strong. Now we are observing a dollar which is weak. And that, of course, is creating uh, changes in, in prices, which means that for net importing countries, it's, it's cheaper to import, but you lose competitiveness in terms of exports. And also means, like for indebted countries, that they can pay better their debt. But, but again, our expectation is that as things evolve and as all the monetary plans of the countries in the north start to push even more, and the situation could change again to what we were facing before. This is just to look at the exchange rate and how it has evolved. If you compare April to August, look at the reds, which were negatives, so weaken of the dollar, and now the positives, the greens. No? So that's exactly what I was saying. There was a significant change between April and August, which is reflecting what we are observing today in, in the food prices. If we look at the overall COVID-19 pandemic and how it has worked uh, on the investment flows on wheat, maize, rice, and soybeans, we see that the movements on investment flows remain largely stable. Uh, basically, look at the red line and, and look at the blue and the green, they are mostly stable. In recent weeks, uh, the, the managed money, which is the red line, uh, trimmed its small net short for wheat and reduced its net short for maize by half, while increasing its net long for soybeans. And commercials continue to maintain their standard net short positions in wheat and soybeans, while reversing the temporary net long in short term in maize. maize. What we will be observing because of the uh, depletion of the stocks of pork for China is that they will start demanding more, more pork meat and that would put some pressure on, so on soybeans and other inputs of feedstock. And that's why we are observing lately some, some increase in prices. Now, what is the cereal situation today? And it's very important to have it very clear. This is something that we have been working intensively with the agricultural market information system. The production is heading towards to another record. It's 2,765 million tons, up 58 million tons year to year. Maize and rice outputs are forecast to reach new records, but a small production decline is expected for wheat, but it's because of the problems facing the EU. Utilization is forecast to 2,746 million tons, up to 2.4% year to year, which means that the stocks even will continue to rise. Uh, so stocks by the close of the 2021 season are projected to increase by 1.7% year to year. And in the graph that you can observe here, you will see the evolution of the stocks. And also you can see the production and the utilization. So we have a very good utilization rate, but we have significant stocks. This is completely different to what we face in 2007, 2008, where the major problems was very low stocks, and therefore we couldn't we couldn't handle the situation of the droughts that were happening, which which create a supply shock in that time, in that period of time. Today we have significant stocks. Although one risk, and it's important to alert, is that a significant part of this share of the stocks is an increase in the stocks from China, which has been increasing over time. There is also the other countries have increased their stocks, but China has been the one increasing the most. So again, we have some level of concentration in who is the owner of those stocks which depends also on how will be the restocking policy of China in the next uh, year to see how, how much pressure will be in the market. Although a pressure to the market of food prices in the staple will be good at this point because the recession is supposed to make prices decline, which will be bad for producers. So some little pressure could help to, to stabilize even more prices. This is just the stock to use ratio for cereals and it indicates a relatively comfortable supply and demand prospects. Uh, the forecast is 31.8 of all the stock to use ratio and, and the major exporter stock to, to disappearance ratio is 19.1. So this, this is down slightly from the last year, the, the zero the stock to use ratio and, and the lowest in four years, but it's still relatively high from historical perspective. So how we can summarize the world of the staples, which is the first joke and, and what we were concerned at the beginning of the COVID-19, because the problem of the COVID-19 at the beginning was that they put health measures, immediately locked down, and they forgot about the importance of the food value chain. And, and the sector reacted to that, and, and there was a lot of uh, uh, efforts to try to tell the world that we need to keep the food value chains alive because people need to eat. No matter that we are locked and we need to eat. So, and that was resolved. Uh, and, and that uncertainty creates some issues in policies, which I will explain later, but now it's resolved. So similar to the situation during the second half of 2019-2020 season, the food markets are expected to confront important uncertainties beyond their own fundamentals, uh, and also in 2021. The macroeconomic concerns, in particular weak economic growth prospects, developments in energy and currency markets, along with continued trade tensions, not to mention uncertainties associated in Africa's swine fever, which is the reason why of the purchase of, of more uh, uh, pork meat from, from China, and also the desert locusts. Uh, desert locusts, the problem right now, we have control it, it doesn't arrive to West Africa, but it still is in East Africa, in, in the Sahel. Uh, the problem is that it's coming back to Kenya again. So that could increase again the risk uh, of, of the presence of desert local, which basically can destroy significant amounts of production. 
However, the prospects are, are good, really good for 20. So we are not worried about food availability. So for me, the conclusion in Staples is food is available. If we look at high value commodities, the situation is similar. There were a lot of logistical problems at the beginning. Why? Because high value commodities depend on labor force and there was the lockdowns, which didn't allow the labor force to move. Second, they are more perishable. So any delays in transportation costs will affect them. Uh, and, uh, and, and, and that created some pressure over the sector, which initially put some constraints. But now most of it is, has been controlled. Uh, the companies, the private sector has been very active in working with governments to allow food to flow. And that has resolved the problem. So supply chain disruptions during COVID-19, as I mentioned, the shortages of labor, the transportation issues, lower capacity utilization of processing facilities. This is a big problem today, especially for high value commodities, the packaging, the processing, that's where the jobs are at risk. And that's what happened with the mid sector in the US and in Germany and, and in England. It was because people were too close to each other and that created the problem. And that's what we need to be aware now and international disruptions in logistical disruptions. One of the major problems in, in, the, in logistical disruptions, which is still is pending to resolve, is the issue of the, uh, the vessels crews. So in the countries in orange, the vessels still cannot be changed. And that's a problem because uh, countries in North Africa, for example, are net food importers. Argentina is a huge exporter of staples and Peru is a, and Colombia are huge exporters of, of high value commodities. Now, what this means is that crews, which have a maximum of six to nine months to have their crew in the sea, if they cannot switch their vessel soon in those countries, they could disrupt the mobility of food. So that's something that we are putting a lot of pressure to governments, working with them to try to find ways in which they can put food safety uh, uh, health measures in their ports. Because basically what it means testing the people that you are switching, if they are infected, you have to quarantine them. But that's, they shouldn't be disrupting the, the movement. And there has been joint statements to try to support that. Trade restrictions was a problem at the beginning. There were 20 countries putting trade restrictions, uh, 22 countries, sorry. This immediately reduced, but even with the 22, we were talking about a 5% of the share of the global trade. In 2007, 2008, there were 33 countries and which implied 20% of the global trade, B very different. But now this 22 is zero basically. So the share of the exports right now affected by trade restrictions is close to zero, very minimal uh, effects of, 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 of exports. And this was export quotas and some uh, limited numbers put some export restrictions. But, but again, this is now resolved uh, and we need to keep, these are risks still there, but we need to keep uh, putting transparency of information to the world to, to assure that things are okay. There were some measures to encourage imports, uh, several countries lower import barriers, mainly in the form of suspending import tariffs. And that's basically to increase and reduce prices to local producers. And also TBT, technical barriers uh, were lowered. Uh, and most measures were temporary, which was okay. All of these are established and, and resolved. But what is important is that one of the solutions, at, at least that we are foreseeing, is that we need to increase intra-regional trade. And non-tariff barriers are something that is creating a barrier to, create, to move food, and especially in Africa. And that's why we are pursuing and pushing for the Pan-African Food Safety Agency to be able to resolve that. And then there were the typical policies of, of price controls uh, in the countries that we are trying to bring evidence to try to minimize those and the major problems we are seeing in prices, because we are tracking prices real time, is in the protected crisis countries. No, we have 55 countries in crisis, but some of them are really in a significant problem because of conflict. And in those, basically, the situation of the lockdown exacerbated a little bit more the situation. But clearly, uh, what we have seen uh, today is that on the supply side, we need to be alert about the production and having the health. So our position is you have to have food, uh, health, and, 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 and food, and development has to be together. That triology, we cannot allow it to not happen because we are reactivating the economy with COVID-19 there and, and a potential second wave, which is already starting in many, in many parts. So we need to put the health protocols to be able to keep the food uh, value chain alive. If not, we run the risk that we will close the food value chain because of health reasons. And that's not what we want to happen. No? So we need to keep alert on logistical. We are tracking real time movement of people and avoid any potential effects from existing crisis. On the demand side, that's the big problem. No? We are going to face a huge recession. IMF says minus 4.8 GDP decline, GDP growth decline, significant potential increases in poverty. The bank is saying more than $100 million, a hundred million people moving to extreme poverty. If we're saying something similar, that's a huge problem. So food access is the problem. Food availability is not the problem. Food access is the problem. And this could affect consumption patterns because people could eat uh, lighter diets and that could create an effect over quality of diets and of course on overweight and, and, and obesity. So we need to be really focus this and strengthen this to avoid a huge problem in terms of demand. 
and that's where the safety nets programs play a role, but also on doing productive uh, projects that will allow us to reactivate the demand by, for example, doing public works that is linked to productive activities so that we invest in something that pay off rather than just supplying subsidies. And that's really important because what you want to avoid is this scenario, you know, the scenario where we could have 132 more million people undernourished in the world because of COVID-19. We are basically running three scenarios, but the, the worst is 132 million. That is putting us completely out of achieving SDG2, and that's what we have to try to, to avoid. So what are the lessons learned just to finish? We need to urgently need to accelerate food and agriculture system transformation. So business as usual doesn't work. These meat plants productions, people next to each other, no matter we put plastic barriers, that doesn't work, and that will change substantially. That will move towards automatization, and that means that we need to create the labor supply that has the skills to respond to that automatization. And this is basically going to affect differently females to males because most of the food packaging processing and distribution is done by females and that that's where we need to be very careful digital technologies will play a crucial role but they are not the panacea if i want to do e-commerce i need four things i need of course the connectivity i need the platform i need mobile money but i also need the capacity to move the goods and that's where most developing countries fail they don't have the mailing system if you don't have the four things it won't work Africa has mobile money, can have some connectivity, can have the platform, but doesn't have the mailing system. So we need to prepare for that. International trade needs to move because that's where we allocate resources efficiently. And we need to promote intra-regional trade. It's incredible that you can, to buy a product, you have to go out of a continent because it's more expensive than to buy it to the neighbor that produces the same product. That is even worse in the small islands, in Caribbean islands, for example, that are completely food import dependent. So we need to change that abruptly to be able to, to, to move ahead. Last but not least, COVID-19 has highlighted the critical importance of international collaboration and coordination. I think that's central. We need to collaborate and we need to coordinate and we need to increase transparency. And I think th this time we were prepared in terms of information on serials. AMIS was able to push transparency, transparency of information and that helped enormously for countries to respond and move back their policies of export restrictions. So with that, thank you very much. And sorry, it took a little bit longer. Thank you so much, Maximo. Um, I am not sorry that it took a little bit longer because your presentation was excellent and uh, I've, I'll have a few follow-up questions for you that we'll come back to in a few minutes. So thank you so much, Maximo. Um, and I, I'd like to turn now to our first panelist who is Rob Voss, the Director of Markets, Trades and, and, the Inst and Institutions Division at IFPRI. Prior to IFPRI, Rob held positions at the UN Food and Agriculture Organization and the UN Department of Economic and Social Affairs, UN DESA. Rob is joining us from Amsterdam today. So Rob, thank you so much for, for being here with us. Rob, my first question for you is about, is building on the presentation that Maximo just gave. It's about supply chain disruptions and supply chain stability. And based on your position at IFPRI, can you speak a little bit about places where you've seen evidence of disruptions to global food supply chains and places where you've seen evidence of the stability of supply chains during the COVID-19 pandemic? I, I think that there is a connectivity problem on Rob's okay. end. So maybe we, you could switch and go to Rose first and yes, come back absolutely. to Absolutely. Great. Yeah. I will um, uh, ask Rose a few questions and we'll see if we can get Rob, uh, Rob's audio um, uh, smoothed out and we'll go back to Rob if we're able to. So Rose, <laughs> Rose, thank you very much for joining us from, uh, from near Geneva in Switzerland. Rose okay. is the Seeds, Seed Health Manager at the International Seed Federation. And she joined the International Seed Federation this spring, bringing with her many years of experience in seed research and regulatory work. So Rose will be speaking with us from the perspective of seed value chains. Rose, thank you so much for joining us today. Thank you so much, Caitlin, for the invitation. It's a pleasure to be here with you all. Good, likewise, great to see you. Um, okay, so starting with, oh, with a few questions for you. Um, can you describe for our audience what ISF does for those of us who are not as familiar with International Seed Federation? Yeah, absolutely. So the International Seed Federation is a non-government, non-profit making organization that represents the interests of the seed industry at the global level. We have been representing our members since 1924, so we're coming close to our centenary and is widely regarded as already as a voice of the global seed industry. And today we have over 8,000 members, which include breeders, producers, traders of small, medium and large scale from the local, regional and international cooperatives, companies, of course, and associations, especially national seed associations. 
we remain committed as ever to our role as one of the contributors to the food supply chain. And it has been highlighted by the World Bank report in 2017 that seed is the most important input on the crop production. So our vision is to make quality seed accessible to all, of course, supported by a sustainable agriculture and to support the food security. Our mission is to best the environment for the movement of seed and plant breeding innovation. And as that was highlighted, the, the seed industry is an international seed industry. And seeds move across the world to, before it can reach the final country, which is the country of sale. So as a result, we work alongside in partnership with a number of organizations by rep representing the seed industry. And some of the organizations included UECD, which is the Organization for Economic Cooperation and Development, UPOV, IPPC, CVD, and the World Intellectual Property Organization. Okay, thank you. Thank you, Rose. That uh, sounds formidable with 8,000 members um, to, with your federation. So I imagine that you have a great visibility into the entire industry. Um, so my, my first question for you is about your experience with the International Seed Federation. I understand you joined ISF relatively recently in March. And um, just, you know, you, you and I were chatting earlier about what your expectations were for the impacts of the pandemic when the pandemic started. So wondering if you could tell us what were your, your expectations for the impacts of the pandemic on the seed industry? And then what did, what did you see happen to ultimately? Actually, the, I would say it was more of a concern. I think when uh, uh, the COVID, uh, the, the whole system of the pandemic starts to be put in place, it was a huge concern from the seed industry, how the extent would be of the, the health measures that will be put in place. It's important to highlight that this is a new virus. And so a lot of the information was not out there when the virus, when the pandemic, when we start to hear about this virus in the end of December, and then moving from March, whether all the extent of the measures was put in place, I would say it was a great concern how the extent would be of these measures. But actually what we happened is that we many countries took public measures and therefore as a seed sector, it was for us highly critical that many countries would classify the food and the agricultural sector as a whole as essential or system relevant to allow the continuation of the movement of goods and to allow the employees to continue the work. So the International Seed Federation released statements starting from March, urging the governments to allow, uh, allow the industry to carry on its activities because those in the seed sector belong to this cat category of essential and to continue the work as part of the essential, essential services to sustain the delivery of seed to farmers was seen as, as vital for it. So seed country companies were allowed to carry on all these essential services such as seed production, the cleaning, the packing, and the distribution of seed, including lab services, which is incredibly fundamental to maintain the food security. Especially if we take into consideration the hardest hit countries where this work is critical to ensure that the farmers can carry on, continue growing their crops during the coming plant season. So we saw what we actually experienced that the governments were very quick to react. We did have issues in terms of delays of issue of the phytosanitary certificate, which is incredibly, is, is the passport for all this, the seed movement. So it was, in, this is done as a paper. So it was really important that some governments took the initiative to organize alternative arrangements when sending and accepting the five cent certificate via the different mechanisms, including online tools. So we saw as well that existent initiatives like the electronic phytocentric certificate, which is something that the seed industry really support of, has seen a surge in its adoption and implementation. And we have noticed that online tools is incredible important in times of a health crisis like the one we're going through and has been recognized as a versatile to the current paper systems. Okay, thank you, Rosa. Let, let me uh, ask another question right here. Can you give us a, some examples of what you saw region by region? Yes, I can, I can tell you some examples that we went through. So if we say, for example, in South Africa, because the seed industry, it was uh, found to be critical for the food security so the seed companies were allowed to carry on. We have the situation as well on, in the South America where some countries like Brazil and Argentina unfortunately have some delays in shipment, but this was uh, rectified later on. In the situation we have in Europe where green lanes was, or 
institutes uh, were made happening, which means that the transportation of foods across the, the continent was able to be able to carry on. And we also, we had the situation on the Philippines where because the seed industry was considered to be essential, essentially critical to the infrastructure, so similar uh, implementation of the grain lanes that happened in uh, Europe was so implemented, implemented there, which what happened is that facilitated the movement of the transports of the seeds and the goods across the countries. So this is some of the examples I would like to highlight that has happened and has facilitated to maintain the movement of seeds and that it was also important to be able to maintain the work of the seed industry and of course the farmers. Okay, thank you. And uh, forgive me if you've already answered this question, but can you give us a sense of how many countries have adopted these green lanes? Um, is this something we're seeing world right, worldwide right now or there's, are there still some that have not yet that we're trying to encourage to do that? It, I would say that the great majority took the interest and to be using the word the green lanes, it was more adopted from Europe, so you include all the European countries and to us some other countries on Asia region. But I would say it was very much different for the different countries, but I would say the implementation and the understanding that the seed industry, it is an essential service that was much more adopted much more widely. Okay, so it seems like there have been uh, changes recently, like the um, use of online certificates instead of paper certificates, like the adoption of these green lanes. Um, can you tell me, based on your global visibility of seed supply chains, and also coming back to your first point that seed is certainly one of the most, if not the most important input to, to global food supply chains, um, what, are, what are some of your ultimate takeaways of the impact of COVID-19 on, on, uh, on the seed industry? I would say one of the most important things it was, it allows to have a much more strict, a much more better relationship between the private sector and the government. The communication, the transparency that happens between both of them has facilitated that we have carried on with our activities. So communication has been very important and I would say that this is one of the things we would like to see going forward as well. And we would like to highlight that the seed industry it is an international industry. So it is important that we take into consideration that measures should not be implemented to be able to restrict the movement. The industry relies on being able to, to have seeds growing in one country and then moving across the world to be able to, uh, to provide these new genetic, new resources to other countries. So is, is important for me, uh, for what we see is that the, some of the biggest takeaway is the communication, clear communication, more strength on the relationship and the partnership that has been between the public and the private sector. Okay, thank you, Rose. That seems like a, a positive note that we're ending on. And it also seems like this relates to the final point in Maximo Torero's presentation about the importance of transparency, transparency, transparency. So it seems Absolutely. like communication is clear, but we can benefit from a commitment to clear communication for the duration of the pandemic. So, thank you so much for joining us, and we'll come back to you um, for some Q and A with the audience from the audience in a few minutes. So, thank you, Rose. Thank you. Um, great, thank you. So, we will try again to speak with with Rob Voss. Is Rob with us? Let's see. Um, Good. One, one more try with Rob. Are, are you here, Rob? Yes, I am. I can hear you. Yeah. Sorry, the, the audio seems to be choppy. Vim Leonard, can you give me a signal if, if, if you can hear Rob? No, I think it's to do with the audio. Rob, could you just uh, switch off your video and see or connect through the phone perhaps? Can you just speak into the mic and let's see how it comes through now? No, I don't think we're getting yeah, clear okay. audio from you. Maybe yeah. you could just call in through the phone if you can and switch okay. the video on. Disconnect and connect again. Yeah, disconnect and connect again. And also it would be great. I'm sorry to interrupt, but it would be great if he just kept his video on, called in through the phone. Um, okay, thank you. We will try to, to get Rob... Um, some good audio. And in the meantime, I would like to have a conversation with Rose and Maximo. Maximo, I do have some follow-up questions um, based on your presentation. Um, 
Let's see. Great. And Maximo, we can we can hear you. You're, yes. I'm assuming your audio audio is still is still good. So Maximo, um, uh, again, thank you so much for the incredibly comprehensive presentation. Um, uh, before your presentation, I had a few questions, but then with your presentation, I do have a few follow up questions. But um, but one very general question for you is: um, Can can you underscore again if it's not supply chain disruptions? that are causing rising food insecurity today that we're seeing around the world. What are the major causes of rising food insecurity? Of course, the, the, the increase in food insecurity, as I said, is not an issue of food availability. Food is available. It's an issue of food access. And why is that? It's because of, we are living in a huge recession, a decline of GDP growth in minus 4.8% overall in the whole world, with developed countries having declines of 9 or 8%, and developing countries like Peru, minus 14%. Okay, Africa, China, only at 1%, uh, it, it's a huge, it's a, we are not realizing how tough the situation will be. It's a lot worse than the previous recession. And that what means jobs. The first thing that falls is jobs. Now, of course, yeah. the developed countries have unemployment insurance, the developed countries have uh, social security, no? So Europe, until the end of this month, have unemployment insurance. Now they are moving to social security, now they are going to start to suffer. But developing countries are mostly informal economies. And they don't have that. They don't have that. And so they are losing their capacity to buy food. Yeah. And up to now, they have been coping, but this is going to get into a critical situation. And that's why food insecurity could be increasing. Now, okay. it is true that Africa is not as bad as we expected, because the level of, of COVID is not what we were expecting, only in the South and in the West. But in the East, it's, it's OK. You have Tanzania with 500 cases. That has been great. They have been able to cope. But the problem is that they will have less demand for the produce in what they live. Nigeria, Nigeria oil. Fall, falling price. Many countries mm -hmm. have gold falling price. Mali cotton falling in price. So they have a huge effect over the revenues. This year they were able to get some uh, release because they are not paying the service of the debt, but next year they will start paying it again. So again, uh, they are going to face the consequences of the recession. And that's where oh. we need to find ways to resolve that. Okay. Okay. Um, I appreciated your comparison of, of the uh, global food uh, insecurity crisis we're experiencing today with the crisis we experienced in 2007-2008. So after the 2007-2008 crisis, the general approach that, uh, that most donors in most countries um, accepted was to increase production, um, particularly of staple crops, which was appropriate given the nature of that crisis in 07-08. So I think this is the, the million dollar question, but what do you think should be the, the approach around which the global community um, coalesces to address food insecurity in this crisis? No, what we will be observing, and we are already observing, a staple production will remain good and high. That's what mm -hmm. we observe. And why? Because there is the pressure of demand uh, from China, which is basically allowing prices not to go down. They're basically stable or, or some of them going up. And that's good in certain way. That's what I was saying, because that helps that we have the, the global supplies that we need. The other, the major problem is what happens with production of high value commodities. No? And they will be facing a significant reduction in demand. Uh, and that's where we need to find ways in which we can assure that the next planting season is okay. Uh, for, for small holders, for medium holders, they are the ones that will be facing the major challenge, no? because they won't be able to sell most of the produce. Most of it will be left in the field, which will increase losses. Uh, but uh, they will have a problem of liquidity to plant for the next season. And that's where we need to find a smart solutions. No? Like, for example, we were proposing the idea of central banks giving collaterals of 100% for small holders. It's a one-year shot. You have to do it because that will assure liquidity to them. For large holders, you make competitive. You give less, less, less collateral. But for small holders, you have to find ways to give them the liquidity. And also to think smartly, uh, you need to have capacity of increasing the resilience, like storage facilities. No? So we are working intensively mm -hmm. in designing optimal locations of storage facilities in Africa so that farmers can store for a period of time uh, their produce, no? which we believe is important because that, that will allow them. And if we do it well, we can link them to the financial systems through warehouse receipt systems, and that will allow them to be able to, uh, to have financial access, doing factoring with, with, with what they put in the warehouse. OK, thank you. Thank you. Um, uh, very much appreciate those responses. And um, of course, as you and I discussed earlier this week, um, um, those involved in food production are not the only ones at risk right now. So there are many people um, in, uh, in, in many sectors experiencing food insecurity. So can you speak a little bit about how the food insecurity as experienced by people is different from what, from what we saw in 07, 08? Yeah, because the problem right now is that this is affecting uh, everywhere. So the unemployment rates are mostly in peri-urban and urban areas. And that is what is creating new hotspots of food insecurity. We, we know how to handle food crisis countries. Those are in specific areas no, of rural areas. 
Now the problem is, is in urban areas, in peri-urban areas, because that's where the bigger unemployment is happening. If you look at the, at the food system and, and the jobs, it's around 1.2 billion jobs that we generate in the food system. And for 35% of it is at risk, 450 million jobs. That means like, like 1.2 billion livelihoods. Now, where are the major cuts are in packaging, processing, and delivery. 60% of those jobs are at risk. And these are in peri-urban areas because of electricity, because of energy. These are not in, 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 in rural areas. So again, and are, are mostly females also. So, so again, we need to figure out because this is going to increase inequality substantially. And that's what we, we keep arguing is important to identify the new hotspots of food insecurity because it's not a traditional way. Uh, and we need to be smart on that because we need to target and prioritize uh, safety nets or, or, or social, social protection programs, uh, which have to be changed because we need to target, like imagine the schools are closed kids cannot get food through the school. So we need to yeah. work with food banks to deliver food. So a lot yeah. of changes that has to allow us to move fast and, and change the way we used to do social protection. Okay, um, uh, apologies for putting you on the spot, but um, have you seen um, any interventions, interventions that you think are particularly effective um, uh, in light of the, the, the new nature of this challenge? You said that it's, it's people in patch, packaging, processing, delivery, uh, those jobs in urban areas, mainly many of them among women. Have you seen any smart interventions to address no. challenges among those populations? Yeah, I have seen very good, in, like, the, like the U.S. established one, which was good. Uh, basically, they, they subsidize their high value producers, but they condition that to deliver it to the food banks. So if you want to get the subsidy, you have to package the food and send it to the food banks and then they deliver it to people. That's very smart. And that should be replicated around. Uh, it's a good option uh, because what we'll have, and that's when I am saying, if I'm going to give a collateral for a small farmer producer of mangoes in Africa, I give him the collateral of 100%, but with the condition that he sells in the local market mm -hmm. because he won't be able to export. No? The mm. was, but instead of living in, in the tree, he should sell. So we put conditionalities, which will help to have more supply of healthy diets. So, yeah. so we need to find those type of solutions. We have also seen a huge job of food banks to replace the school delivery system. Uh, in many countries, that has been starting to, to happen. Um, and we have seen uh, significant solutions of private sector companies finding ways in which they can reduce the number of lines of production so that they can only sell, instead of 10, sell three lines of production, but mm -hmm. being able to find the inputs for those so that they didn't stop producing. And in some cases, it has been very profitable. If I, I talk with companies in Africa and they don't feel the problem yet, they feel that they have demand. So again, things are okay, things are moving, but the recession is the problem. The, 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 okay. the recession that we're going to face for me is the problem. And, and we need to fight solidarity also, no? Uh, yeah. Solidarity is crucial because all the pre-packages that we are delivering in the North countries of huge financial support, monetary policies is going to affect the exchange rate. In certain ways, affecting developing countries that don't have that capacity. So just a 0.3% of tax to all those trillions of dollars that are being imposed could resolve our problem of, of food insecurity in the developing countries. <laughs> um, well, uh, we, we might come back to that, um, but I think this is a good stopping point. Thank you again. And let's try for a third time, hopefully thir three, third time is the charm, um, with Rob Voss. So let's, let's, let's check the audio. Rob, I think you're on mute. Yeah, it's okay. I still see a mute sign for, for Rob. Yeah, I was trying with my phone. Now it's going to be double. So. Well, I think third time is the charm because I can hear you much better right now. So, um, thank you, thank you for working that working out the technical uh, difficulties on your end. So, um, thanks for working that out. Again, appreciate you joining us today from Amsterdam. So, like to start again with 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 a question that I had asked earlier, um, based on your position at IFPRI, where you're looking at food policy around the world. Um, and also in light of the, the presentation we just heard from Maximo, what is some evidence of, of food supply chain disruptions, but most imp more importantly, what's the evidence of food supply chain stability you've observed over the past six months or seven months? I'm back on the computer now. And so that seems to be working. Um, well, largely food system has held up quite well as uh, Maximo has emphasized. Um, I think one of the key problems are with the logistics, right? So. Um, we've seen quite a bit of disruptions um, in transportation, in particularly of perishable foods, um, West Africa, um, where normally a lot of the perishable foods are transported during the night with curfews that could not happen again. And uh, as a result, 
it's done for, to, during the day if possible, uh, but then with uh, incurring a lot of food losses and uh, food mm. shortages of those products. Um, other problems have emerged because of COVID-19 that uh, like in Nigeria, I've seen food markets closed, so, so the local markets that were entirely closed. Um, so I think uh, what, what those kinds of examples bring to bear is the importance of uh, creating well-functioning value chains, uh, including with proper storage space, with um, um, cool transportation, but also um, having the right uh, measures in place so that markets don't have to close because that's bad for both consumers, they can't access the food, as well as for farmers because they can't sell the food they produce uh, on the market. And so some of the spikes in food price, domestic food prices we've seen uh, are in part because of those, those reasons, and in some cases a paradox of uh, um, uh, food losses, uh, food that went to waste uh, with uh, rising food prices um, uh, because of uh, people um, not being able to access food and shortages uh, in the market. Okay. So, um, it, 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 so I think uh, what, what it brings to bear is what others have said is it's important to, to uh, strengthen the, um, the value chains across the board, right? So not just look at what farmers do, what consumers need, but uh, strengthen integration of value chains, particularly in developing countries, uh, where um, those um, chains tend to be the weakest. Okay. Well, you just mentioned not just to look at what farmers do and not just to look at consume what consumers do. What are the other things that we should be looking at across food 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 value chains? Sorry, I couldn't hear your question. So. Okay, sure. I'll ask it again. Um, you just mentioned that we shouldn't look only at what farmers are doing with production, and we shouldn't look only at what consumers are doing, but we should look at um, at, at other aspects within food um, food value chains and food food supply chains. Can you give us some examples of what some of those things are? Well, it's, it's, as I mentioned, it's a lot of the distribution networks they they were disrupted uh, either because of um, restrictions on mobility of people uh, and of workers. Uh, so where that got resolved, that's where then the supply chains uh, started working again. Uh, but also seen in, in parts of India, as well as a lot of people that fled uh, the fear from the disease, they fled back to their rural areas and uh, that also uh, limited the connectivity with um, uh, urban markets. All right, so, um, what we have to look at is, is the entire supply chain, and that's where uh, we're seeing the, the, the largest problems in the logistic, transportation, storage, uh, and also how um, uh, the um, stores uh, at the consumer end uh, worked in the retail sector. Okay, okay, thank you. Thanks for fleshing that out for us. Um, can you give us a sense um, of the impacts of supply chain disruptions or stability, however you'd like to look at that, but the impact of food supply chains on food security during the pandemic. So do you think that the net impact is that there is um, better food security because supply chains have been functioning well? No, certainly not. It's the only thing we're saying is that um, supply chains have held up relatively well under the circumstances, right? It's not like um, because of COVID-19, food security now has improved. It has uh, gone down, but the main problem as uh, Maximo emphasized is, uh, is food access because of the global recession uh, and uh, the loss of income of, of uh, many people uh, around the world. But also, and that's where the supply chain uh, disruptions come in, uh, they affect particularly uh, the perishable foods, that uh, fruits and vegetables, but also meats and dairy products, which um, are higher in nutrient uh, content. And so we've seen a shift in consumption away from those products because they've become either uh, less accessible because of higher prices or non-availability and uh, towards uh, the more traditional staple foods that uh, are not unhealthy per se, but they're more calorie rich and less in, in nutrients. Okay. So those, those shifts and that uh, is uh, aside from um, the loss of income and the uh, problems of access to food uh, by poorer people, uh, also uh, a loss in uh, the diversity in what people uh, eat in their diets uh, because of increased prices or uh, lesser availability in places. 
Okay, thank you, Rob. You were able to anticipate my next question, which was going to be about the impact of supply chain disruptions on dietary diversity and nutrition, because as you and Maximo have said, it's the foods that are the most perishable that are often the most um, high in, in, in nutri uh, nutritional value. Um, so, so thanks for, for giving us a sense of the impact of supply chain disruptions on nutrition among populations. Um, my last question for you before I turn to Q&A with the audience is, what do you think will be the lasting impacts of COVID-19 on global food supply chains? So we're seeing temporary disruptions and temporary um, accommodations, but what do you think are gonna be the lasting impacts? Um, it's still hard to say. It's uh, hopefully not these consumer shifts. You'd hope that once the prices uh, uh, readjust and uh, people uh, get back their incomes that they might return to more diverse food. But it might also be something that uh, um, might persist for a longer period of time. Um, what I do think is that uh, maybe a lasting impact and that doesn't apply equally to all contexts, is um, the greater use of digitalization in also in logistics and supply chains. So we've seen quite a bit of shifts in China, India, uh, but also in, uh, in Europe and the United States towards more food delivery, but use of um, um, digital platforms to, for distribution networks. So uh, we see that on a grand scale with, with large companies like Walmart, uh, um, as well as Amazon, uh, um, in getting bigger, big time engaged in, in those platforms and also in distribution of food. But we also see them connect to smaller chains. And we see that in China, uh, that connect with small and medium uh, enterprises. In India, uh, there's, there's a platform called Swiggy that uh, has expanded quite a bit uh, during COVID-19. Of course, the extent, I think that those things, those changes will uh, will last for also beyond this crisis, uh, as it will impact on how distribution networks uh, work and also how consumers uh, want to acquire their their food. Uh, but of course, um, that, those impacts will be bigger in context where there's bigger mass markets of consumers. Uh, and also uh, better infrastructure to uh, develop these kinds of digital uh, platforms. But certainly that's one of the changes uh, I've seen that uh, I think yeah. will be last will okay. change food markets in the future. Okay, thank you. Good, thank you, Rob. I think we'll stop there um, and we'll go to um, turn to questions from our audience. And um, Rob, thank you again for joining us. Glad we were finally able, able to figure out the audio. Um, and let's see, uh, for audience members, um, if you haven't done so yet, if you have questions, you're welcome to submit them at the Q&A tab at the bottom of the Zoom platform. So let's take a look. Um, let's see. Quick, but hopefully, I hope this is an easy question to answer, um, but wondering from, um, I guess it would be either Rob or Max who can answer this question, but have you seen any data on global food loss and waste rates during the pandemic? Yeah, so I can, I can say something. Uh, because I, I, I am working on a paper which I was supposed to deliver, but I couldn't finish. But uh, so what we are seeing, so the, the, the rate of food loss right now, the food loss index that FAO developed is 14 14%. That's the level of losses. No? Losses, not waste. Losses is from post-harvest to, mm. to wholesale included. Waste is from retail to consumer. So in terms of losses, what we are, what we are seeing, uh, if you apply the, the potential rates of elasticities given the reduction in demands, is that it could be, I cannot give an exact figure, but it could increase, especially pre-harvest. So in left in the field, what we call left in the field. And that will happen uh, mostly in high value commodities where the loss rate in high value commodities by itself is a lot higher than the staple. So it's around 30%. So, so that's where we are expecting increases. And on waste, we, we, we observe some increase at the beginning, but then the increase is starting to smooth out because consumers start to figure out how to buy. So they were not buying anymore for, panic buying that, they, that was the initial case. No? So, so not exact numbers yet, they will come, but a um, potential increase, significant potential increase in, in left in the field. So even before the post-harvest. 
Okay, thank you. Thank you very much for that. Um, and related to this is, is another question, um, which is with the loss of um, diversity in foods and the loss of high value slash nutritious foods, what, what nutritional deficiencies do you think that people are most um, susceptible to in the time of COVID? I imagine this, this, the answer differs region to region, but do you have a sense of that, of the types of malnutrition we might see because of the, of the COVID-19 pandemic? Before COVID-19, we had 3 billion people that didn't have access to healthy diets. And the definition of healthy diets is, is in addition to a nutrition diet, to have the minimum nutrition components, to have diversity of the diet. And that's what makes each region different. Now, we don't know yet because for the people that could have access, so there will be a big group of people that won't have access. And that's the problem, okay? And that's where we need to work and to innovate so that we give them ways to have access, especially of good diets. But for the ones who will stay having access, uh, the situation could change because uh, if there is more supply because of the lack of exports, uh, because of the lower demand of, of developed countries, then it could be that local prices of those commodities could reduce. And that means that healthy diets could become more affordable. So you could have a different effect than what you normally would have expected. But if that is not the case and the, and the supply side adjusts immediately and reduce the production, which is difficult in trees. So for fruits, it's very difficult because you cannot stop producing in trees. Yeah. Uh, it's more easy for vegetables, okay? Uh, that, that could be uh, something different. So again, the diversity could be affected, but if the income is, is the real income goes substantially down as we expect, then what we expect is a shift towards uh, staple foods, which means uh, more overweight, more obesity, more NCDs. No? Sure, okay. Okay, thank you, Maximo. Um, Rob, do you have anything to add, uh, add to that answer? No, just uh, maybe to add for first, uh, um, there's also precondition, right? People that uh, are less um, less, less uh, suffer from more uh, malnutrition are more susceptible to COVID-19, right? We know that affects your immune system. So, um, so I think that, that that's that's one starting point. Of course, then if if the, if the diets deteriorate, those preconditions um, and predisposition for uh, getting COVID-19 increase. Um, what we all have seen, that, uh, but it's more like an undercurrent, is some change in consumer habits that uh, some people um, have greater awareness of it. And we see that in both developed and developing countries, of people shifting to healthier diets um, uh, because of that. So, um, so we have seen a bit of a paradox, right? So because of incomes, in some cases because of fears that... Uh, the more uh, the fresh fruits and the fresh vegetables, maybe, uh, and also meats, um, could be contaminated, um, so they consume less of it. Um, but also, people have greater awareness that uh, they're shifting to healthier diets, and uh, we've seen uh, increased growth in also plant-based uh, meat, for instance, in several parts of the world in response to that. But as I said, that's an undercurrent; it's not the main thing that we're observing. So the concerns or increased malnutrition uh, are predominant. I see, okay, okay. Thank you for that, Rob. Um, I do have a, another question about um, market transparency the, um, to, to dig into the final point of Maximo's presentation. Um, what are some specific steps we can do to, to increase the type of transparency that you think we, we need right now, Maximo, in, um, in food trade and food supply chains? Yeah, so, so we need to keep pushing and having the more detailed information on the stocks because right now we know public stocks. There is still some uncertainty in the stocks that some Asian countries have. So we need to reduce that uncertainty, but especially there is a lot of information that we need on private stocks. So private sector stocks that that will help a lot to calm markets. The second element is uh, which basically we were able to resolve is real time vessel information, no? mobility of vessels and what they were moving across borders. That has to become more public and more more high frequency real time so that people can can look at what is happening uh, and 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 lastly uh, keep improving in the capacity to project harvest and 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 to understand how how good the harvest is and for that digital technologies have evolved substantially you know? right now we have a, a geospatial platform in fao the hand in hand geospatial platform that is allowing us to to have a better idea uh, in real time of, of what is the potential harvest at the micro level of the country, which is important. So, so, but we need to keep improving. We don't have all the countries of the world. But, but again, we need to keep innovating to bring as much information as possible into, into, into the markets. 
Okay, thank you. So I uh, take your point about we need to keep innovating to, to bring new information, but there are, there are existing platforms to promote transparency in ag markets. Um, uh, for example, one that was set up by the G20 about 10 years ago. So do you think it's the case that we can simply use platforms that are already exist or should we be creating new ones for the sake of this new crisis? No, so I, I, that is AMIS, no? Agricultural Market Information System. That's the one I am referring. So that is, we are boosting it more because, for example, AMIS never had logistical information. Now AMIS have real-time mobility of vessels information. So we need to keep boosting it. But even AMIS that collects reserves and have been working intensively to have the idea of what are the stocks, we still have problems in certain Asian countries of uncertainty of that information. So the more we can empower those, those initiatives that worked, the better will be. Okay, okay, excellent. Thank you, Maximo. Um, I have um, uh, a question right now on the, the overlapping crises that we're seeing in, in, in some places. So um, some places are seeing some supply chain disruptions along the lines of the ones that you've explained. Um, we're seeing locust swarms in, uh, in East Africa. We're seeing the impacts of climate change in various ways in different parts of the world. Um, so what, uh, uh, all these things happening at the same time as the pandemic. So um, uh, if you could just speak a, a bit about the, the overlapping nature of the crisis that we're seeing right now and um, considering these other uh, impacts, do these other impacts change the recommendations you're giving um, going forward? So the major problem that we're facing in Africa, in Eastern Africa, is the locust, no? And also the fall army worm. Those are the big problems in Africa. In Asia is the African swine fever, uh, which is still is there and is important. Uh, but then you have, of course, COVID-19. Uh, now, in the case of the locust, which is a problem, the, the, the issue there is to resolve the problem. And that means uh, uh, being able to, to, to put in place all the mechanisms to control the plaques. Uh, and that's what is being tried. But, once the plaques are, move, are, are big and the swarms are big, it's very complex and very expensive. No? For the future, what we need to do uh, and what we need to have is very, very, very good early warning mechanisms with predictive power. No? So uh, FAO was lucky because FAO had a unit that has been working on locus for the whole life and, and they were world experts on the topic, but, but the, the governments didn't react to, at the velocity they were alerting and they didn't have the, the tools that they have today. So, so in the last year, we have been able to build tools that allows them to model and to simulate the mobility of the swarms. That, that's how they were able to, to predict the mobility towards Western Africa and they were able to control it. Uh, so, and that's how now they know that the swarms are coming back to, to Kenya and they are trying to avoid that to happen. So again, those type of tools that give you some predictive power are central. The other thing is that we need to start uh, innovating a lot and bringing technology to, to resolve problems like fall army worm. No? It's unacceptable that we have such levels of fall army worm. Uh, and there are other issues like TR4 for the banana, which is like the cancer for the banana. Uh, and we need to find a solution to that. So again, or the, or the rust coffee for Central America. No? Uh, again, what, what we understand from all this is that the surprise element will be there and will continue to be there and will continue to appear with a higher frequency. So yeah. we need to build a, a food system which is resilient. Uh, and, and that's what we need to have in place. And that means having given farmers the capacity to cope with this type of shocks in a better way. Of course, it will never be the best optimal, but it will allow them at least to cope better than what they have today. Okay, okay, thank you. Um, this is a question that, um, that I see addressed a lot of places um, in the media. And I have my own answer to this question, but I'd like to pose it to each of you. And I think it's an important question that we answer. I'll read the, the question in its entirety. In the long term, should we expect a reconfiguration of food trade with an increase in domestic and regional trade at the expense of long distance trade? And if so, can this lead to increased production and consumption of more nutritious but perishable food? But I, I wanna focus on that first question. So do you think that an effect of this pandemic is that we'll see a trend toward local and regional trade at the, at the expense of global trade? You want me to give a first shot at that quickly and then you can... Yes, if you don't mind, since we're already so, talking. So what we know today is that the commodity that moves the less distance in trade is, high, is vegetables, okay? Fruits and staples move the largest than fruits and then meats and fish. Vegetables can be produced locally and they will be produced close to cities. That's what we are seeing now. That's the transformation of COVID-19. Why? Because you can do control environments and they are cost effective. That is going to happen. It's already happening across the world. But in the case of fruits, it's close to impossible. If you want to have fruits available, you have different seasons, different time zones, but you cannot do that, not do that today in controlled environments. The same with fish, meat, and the staples are specialized. So I don't expect that to happen for those commodities. Now, 
that, that, that we have global trade is great because basically we can reassign and, and we can optimize the use of the natural resources. That we need to have more interregional trade? Yes, we need to increase interregional trade. That's a coping mechanism. That's increasing resilience of countries. But by no mean we should be reducing global trade to increase interregional trade. That, that should be a mistake, I, I think, in my personal Okay. Opinion. Thank you. Thank you. That's the, the, that's the ultimate point I wanted to get, get out was, was that. Wondering um, if Rob and Rose, if you agree. So Rob, can we turn to you next? Yeah, I broadly agree with uh, what Maximo said, but first maybe it's good to establish that um, food systems are, are basically local domestic. Anyway, local Rob, it seem, seems like we're having some, I'm sorry, we are having some, um, some ch difficulty with, with your audio, but um, actually I think we have the ability to answer these questions um, through the Q&A function. So Rob, if we can't hear you through your audio, perhaps you can, you can um, contribute some, some answers in writing there. Um, uh, Vim Lundra, can you let me know, were, were you also having issues with, with Rob's audio? Rob, go ahead, give it another try. Yeah. Mayor, we can't hear you. Yeah, okay, okay, um, good. So, sorry about that. And let's, let's turn to Rose for an answer to that question about um, impact uh, and impact of COVID-19. Um, do you think that we should see uh, turn to regional and local trade um, at the expense of global trade because of the pandemic? No, I don't think so. I think we need to be very careful with that because, for example, for the seed industry, it is an international industry, which means that uh, there is no country today that can fully supply farmers with seed of their choice solely on their own production. So seed companies does produce and try seeds in different countries all over the world as a way to mitigate the risk of crop failures due to adverse weather conditions. So it's incredibly important that we do not create an unbalance because for the seed industry, it is incredibly important that we have to, to maintain this international movement. If, for example, if we take for uh, tomato as a, as a seed, which is a vegetable, that situation can be up to five or six different countries before it comes to the country of sale. So it is important. And to maintain innovation on the industry, we do need to maintain this industry as international one. So we need to be very careful and not end up uh, reinforcing the message that everything should be done on the regional level because it, might, it is not going to be possible for all industries which are important for the food supply. Okay, okay, thank you. Um, and Rose, I'm sorry for putting you, on, putting you on the spot, but can you share a few things that you're doing with ISF to, to make sure that global, um, global trade in seeds continues during the pandemic when there might be pressure to, to regionalize and localize trade? So we, I, I do oversee a number of groups and committees that we have inside of the International Seed Federation. One of them is the Five Central Committee, which we have been advocating for a long time, working with governments to, uh, to not exceed the level of regulation. Sometimes what we see is an excessive regulation on seed and seed in itself is a commodity, is a highly regulated one. We do have a lot of processes in place as a seed industry, and we'd like to have this recognized by the government because we also, we wanted to move is uh, healthy seeds. We do not have interest in terms of uh, selling something that will have a problem. So we do have this initiative that we're trying to work. And as a result of it, we have some initiatives inside of the International Seed Federation, like the Ishivej, which we're developing protocols that we will be using as reference and NPPOs for them to recognize that actually we do have uh, our own uh, method, seed test methods that we can guarantee the health of the seed. And also we have our own regulated pest list that we, based on scientific evidence and our own experiences of the industry, we do recognize which are only the pests which are uh, seed as a pathway. So we're trying to, to work with the governments in terms of all excessive regulation. We also want to create a much more environment where there is harmonization, especially harmonization in terms of the, the measures that are implemented because being an international industry means that uh, if every country has a different set of import requirements, that makes the movement of seeds incredibly difficult. So what's happened as a result of COVID there has been a much more communication and transparency between the, the seed industry and the governments. And this is why we wanted to carry on and make sure that we can go working together to be able to maintain the movement of seeds across the, the whole globe. Okay, thank you. Thank you so much for that, Rose. I appreciate that. Um, so this is my second to last question. Um, the last question I'll pose to everyone. This question is directed to FAO, so this will be for Maximo. Um, and the question is, 
with increasing food insecurity in urban and peri-urban areas, what would be potential interventions? Um, Maximo, you've already given one example, but I'm um, wondering if you, can, if you can give some more. And this, an additional question is, does the FAO have plans to engage in urban areas? Uh, yes, uh, so I think the first thing is that we need to know where they are, uh, where these food insecurity hotspots are. We are doing enormous efforts to develop and deploy our food insecurity experience scale for a short term period of recall uh, in three rounds. Uh, we right now have the resources to do it in like 20 countries. Uh, that's important because donors don't realize of how important it is. <laughs> uh, mm -hmm. and, and this was a, a small call, but we couldn't get the resources to do it across the world. We were doing it to, for 100 countries. That's something that I think is essential. The second thing is uh, there are mechanisms of, of uh, uh, safety net programs that you need to put in place. No? So normally these are cash transfers, which we know they are very effective if they are well targeted. We cannot put conditionalities uh, because there are no schools, there are no health centers working normally. And second, public works programs. And I am very inclined towards public works programs because that will help us if they are doing, done properly to target the, the public work site. So the, the, the people you are helping will get a wage, but the public work site to productive projects. Is FAO going to work in urban areas? FAO works in urban areas, in peri-urban areas. We work in the rural urban continuum uh, and we have developed this initiative of green cities, which is basically trying to work with municipalities to bring green areas, uh, agriculture to the, to the cities. So, so we are intensively designing that. We have a big program called the Green Cities that was, la was launched in New York two weeks ago. Uh, so yes, we, we are starting to do that, but our major focus of course is agriculture and rural areas and, uh, and trying to, to work in this continuum. Remember, the agricultural system is, is value chains crosses rural because electricity is mostly in urban and the processing plants, the packaging plants are in peri-urban urban areas. So that's, that's how it works. Okay, thank you. Happy to hear about the scaling up the, of the food insecurity experience scale, which to my knowledge is the global scale that can give us the most, um, most up-to-date information about food insecurity as, it, as it's experienced by people. So I'm um, glad to see that it's, it's being scaled up. So I'm looking forward to learning more, more about that, Maximo. Um, my fi final question, and I'd like to pose this to everyone. I'll go to Rob first in case Rob's audio is, is with us again, um, and then Rose and then Maximo. So the final question is, what actions can we take now as we rebuild our economies and supply chains to make our food systems, food systems writ large, more resilient to the next crisis, what, whatever the next crisis is? Um, I'll, I'll leave it at that. So Rob, we'll, we'll, we'll try with you. Oh, it now works and I'm sorry that it didn't work yet. Okay, we can now. hear you, yep. <laughs> um, yeah, well, that, that's a big question that uh, cannot be answered in very briefly, but uh, I'd like to emphasize what I said in the beginning on logistics, right? So I think what um, is very important is that particularly in the developing countries where uh, a lot of, uh, there are a lot of weak links in, throughout the, the, the supply chain, uh, that those get strengthened. And that has to do with improved infrastructure. So public works, what uh, Maxim was uh, emphasizing is important, uh, but also leveraging the private initiatives, particularly small and medium scale enterprises, along those value chains that are very important, are very active, but require um, the right kind of integration and linkage to uh, the different segments uh, of the market. Uh, I think if, if anything, the lessons we should draw from this crisis is to create a greater resilience in each of these segments. And uh, as, say as agriculture economists, um, uh, we often forget about what's uh, sometimes called the hidden middle of the supply chain, and that's, that's where it is. And I think uh, where you see the, the, the bigger resilience is where those supply chains were already better integrated to begin with okay. uh, and can, kept operating. It's more Wait. I can say, but let me emphasize that point. Okay, thank you so much, Rob. Um, Rose, we'll turn to you and we just for a quick answer since we're, we're, we're almost at the end time now. Yeah, sure. So I would say cooperation between the private sector and between the government, a better understanding of how the, all the actors of the, uh, the food supply are working on, and so carry on the communication and transparency. And I think that we're going to have some very good solid base to be able to uh, work with the next uh, pandemic or whatever the situation will become. But I think collaboration, transparency, communication is incredibly important. 
Okay, thank you, as, as you spoke to throughout, throughout our event today. So thank you very much for that, Rose. Um, Maximo, you did mention earlier that um, there will continue to be disruptions um, that we expect and don't, don't expect. So Maximo, how would you answer this question? Final word with you. So, so I think it's core to, core to increase the resilience of the food systems. And one of the major elements for that is, uh, I, we have four pillars for that in FAO. So it's data, high frequency data, big data, so that we know what is happening and transparency is increased, using technology, innovation, uh, and good governance. I think good governance is central uh, to what we do, uh, because if we don't have the good governance in place, digital technologies won't be a solution, will be a problem. Uh, and we need to have that in place. Uh, and in that infrastructure is core. We know that building infrastructure, but designing it properly. What we have, the problem we have is that we build infrastructure where it was in the past. We upgrade what we had in the past. And if we want to change the way we produce, we need to build infrastructure to link the, the productive sectors, the areas with potential to, to link them to the markets. And that's a different way of looking at infrastructure. It is. So, and, and I imagine you're talking about infrastructure writ large, digital infrastructure, roads, bridges, et cetera. You're talking about all, all, all types? Yeah, there, there is infrastructure, the hard infrastructure and the soft infrastructure. No? So, but the most important right now is for me to, to create the linkages on the storage facilities. So more the value chain type of infrastructure that will provide capacity to farmers to be able to cope with the situation. And okay. of course, roads are central, but, but sometimes, you know, people, trucks can move. They will take more time. But sometimes it, it, they take from in the, in, the, in the two kilometers to get to the main road, it takes five hours. And that's a small cheap road that you can build a rural penetration road. And that, that's where we need to be more smart in, to have this network uh, perception. Okay, good. Thank you. Excellent final word. Um, and I, I wanna thank everyone for joining us today. Thank you again so much to Rose, Rob and Maximo for joining us from Geneva, Amsterdam and Rome. We fit in so much in this short discussion, and I feel like there's so much we can build in, um, perhaps um, leading to, to future events between CSIS and the FAO. Um, but again, thank you so much. Um, you've given us all so much to think about and, and hopefully so much to act on as well. So um, again, I wanna thank the panelists for joining us today. I'd also like to thank the FAO's Liaison Office for North America for their continued partnership with us, with CSIS. And um, last but not least, I'd also like to thank the CSIS Global Food Security Team, Eilish Zimbilci and Ananya Subramanian for your support um, along with the CSIS uh, External Relations Team. Thank you so much. Um, uh, and for more information, please visit CSIS.org and follow us on Twitter at, at CSIS Food. Again, thank you for joining us. Thank you.